Okay guys, so I wanna thank everyone who subscribed already. We've hit 200, which is pretty awesome. And hopefully we'll keep it rolling as long as people like the videos and are interested in what I'm saying. I'll keep making them. Today we're gonna to be talking about something really interesting. And that's gonna be a comparison of a Trek Merlin 5. So this is gonna be somewhat of an entry level mountain bike. And we're gonna compare it to approximately a $13,000 mountain bike and see what exactly is the big difference. So the comparison for today is going to be the Trek Top Fuel and this is its highest end version or oh, pretty close. This is actually this is actually a Top Fuel 9.8 which we have built up to become a 9.9 .9 model. When the customer wanted this bike we were unable to order it so we had to custom make the 9.9 .9 out of a 9.8 which involved putting on the brand new high end wireless shifting so that's one major upgrade so while we're on that let's start right at it so what exactly do you get when you buy a nearly thirteen thousand dollar mountain bike in comparison to one which costs just a little around the six hundred dollar mark with a six hundred dollar bike you are going to get a nice simple basic shimano style shifting unit on this one it is the shimano tourney tourney however you say it and um, this one has a three chain ring on the front and then a seven on the back with a six slash seven derailleur so this has a 12 speed extended range cassette so that means it's got one two three four five six and then a big jump instead of an equal slow break it really in the top two especially the top one goes to a really wide range gear. You combine that with the very small ring on the front and that's how you get your low range. On something like a three by seven, you're probably around that 450, 500% gear ratio percentage range, um, which that is something you would get in as simple as a one by on the front and the 12 speed on the back. So the big tooth on the back is a 50, and then on the front here you've got a 34 tooth in the XX1 part spec. Whereas in comparison sakes, on the back of this one you've got a 32 big, or the biggest ring here is a 32, and then on the front you've got a small little one. You got a small little one. It doesn't say what size it is. I could look it up, but it's kind of irrelevant. With a low end bike like this, you get a three by nine, lots of gears, small fine increments, made for fine tuning what gear you're in, making commuting easy, and making overall the biking experience very easy as opposed to pushing towards a performance base. On something like this, whereas you may lose those teeny tiny increments which you had with a beginner bike, you might not need those small increments. You're able to jump through the gears at a much more rapid succession finding and knowing exactly what gear you're in and then you still have that big 50 tooth at the back to make it a really easy climbing gear. Performance wise of them, this one is cably ran so it runs all the way up and pulls the shifter springs and pulleys in there which actuate it. With the SRAM XX1 Eagle you are on the wireless shifting. So this sends a Wi-Fi secure encrypted code down to here instantaneously. It shifts, it moves really fast. It has an auto clutch, so it will not break. It allows itself to break away if you fall. There is no friction from the cables. It is an instant motor drive to the movement of the chain. So it's really efficient, really fast. As well, when you go up to an XX1 chain and cassette, in front crank combination 
what SRAM states is actually that higher end chain and cassette, they actually have a lot less friction between the two, so they run a lot smoother. One, which is really nice to have, and two, they actually wear down slower. So although you're paying $100, $150 for a chain alone, and a lot of money for that rear cassette, it will actually last longer than the equivalent heavier duty built. So this is made for durability as opposed to efficiency and it's rough durability, so it wears it down. It's able to be ran at really rough condition. You know, people aren't taking care of it. These ones are made at higher performance. People want to take care of them. The next thing we'll jump right onto from there is we can see standard brakes. So this is actually a hydraulically driven brake. Essentially, this has a nice little brake lever on it, which pulls the brakes and they stop. When you come over to something like a $13,000 one, what changes? They actually look very, very similar. You still have the hydraulics. It's a nicer looking lever. It feels a little nicer. You can definitely feel whatever the mechanics in there are a little higher end, or not a little, a lot. The touch and responsiveness is much higher than on the $600 bike. You can brake. They will also have higher power heat dissipation will be much better through a brake set like this, including the caliper combination. So you'll be able to run these brakes at a higher temperature. So the longer you're riding it, the more efficient they're gonna stay, as opposed to something called brake fade would happen with these, whereas the hotter they get, the less efficient they actually work. It does have the carbon fiber rims on this one. So carbon fiber in comparison to an aluminum, one, you're saving you're saving a lot of weight when you go to carbon fiber. Two, you get a lot of stiffness in the torsional twist of it. So what that means is when you're actually turning the corner, so when you're actually turning the corner, there is literally flex in the wheels, it turns, it bends, it morphs. With a carbon one, you're not gonna get that. Carbon also absorbs vibration and impact better than aluminum. If you were to um, have a low tire and hit the rim on a Aluminum one, it's dented and probably broken forever. With a carbon one, it's more likely to actually bounce off of that and ricochet away. Downside is, if you do break it, you just broke a very expensive wheel. This one's probably $100 to replace. This one is probably $1,500. So obviously as well, when you're comparing the two, Merlin does not have a rear suspension. This has a rear suspension, which goes along with a lot of complicated parts, including a cable. So this cable runs up through the tube and attaches to this fancy grip here. This grip actually twists on this section alone, and you can actually lock out both the front and rear suspension at the same time and release it. So what this means is when you're actually climbing a hill, you're able to turn that suspension to a locked out position, therefore getting the power from your pedals straight to the wheels, no efficiency of loss. In some Merlin levels, you are able to manually turn these on and off, but to be honest, most of the time, by the time you're halfway up the hill, you forgot to do it, it's gonna be more cumbersome to try and reach down and you probably never use that feature. The suspension as well, whether it's front or rear, is much higher end. So you go from a 28 mil stanchion on a $600 bike, this one here has a 32. Thicker, it's gonna ride a little stiffer, little better quality of materials, which keep it stiffer. Has the Kashima coating on here, which makes it super smooth riding, really efficient. And yeah, this one's got the 34 on it compared to the 28 of that one. Um, weight savings in everything as well, this, the, everything's gonna be better. So another thing this one has is the standard seat post, no dropper, when you come to something this high end, you are actually getting the RockShop Fever Axis, so the battery's on the back here, and it is ran by a wireless driver up here. Super fast, really efficient, what the drop post really allows you to do is on the aggressive and bumpy kind of terrain, you are able to push that seat out of your way and use more of your legs and your body as suspension 
therefore getting a faster, more efficient ride, as opposed to being stuck with this seat post hitting you, not allowing you and your body to work with the terrain. Obviously as well, with this one, you go in with full carbon fiber frame, saves a lot of weight, absorbs the vibration, carbon fiber handlebar, saves weight, absorbs the vibration, Essentially, everything to do with this one is about long-term comfort of the bike, durability of the bike, long-lasting. The aluminum frames do vibrate. You feel every bump and hit through here. You feel it through the handlebars. It is meant to just get you out there and ride at an affordable price. Carbon fiber is also a stiffer material, so if you're really hammering the corners and turning it, you will actually flex. And what flexes is this down triangle here. And the triangle will actually flex back and forth as you turn and put your weight into it. And it doesn't matter if you're 150 pounds or 250 pounds, it doesn't take much effort to actually flex those. Whereas something like this, you are not flexing. It is staying perfectly still. The higher end bikes as well, you're more likely to go to a fancier pedal. So we've got a clip hole. Well, we've got a clip pedal here, XTR, so it's a higher end bearing. It's gonna last longer, its durability is way higher. You also get a little more efficiency from clipping in, whereas this one will come with standard flats, um, plastic, open bearing, something easy to replace and take the daily driver stuff, but these ones are made to really take a beating. Geometry of the whole bike is completely different. This one is made for speed over rough terrain, and just overall speed. This one is made for speed and getting that power out. So you can almost see right where the pedals are straight up is the tip of the seat. Whereas this one straight up, you're actually a little different positioning. The seat tube angle and the head tube angle are gonna be completely different. This one will allow for a faster power output with an easier ride over terrain and bumps and rougher ground. Whereas this one is gonna be for a more comfy position, therefore allowing you to enjoy the ride better as opposed to try and win the race. So when you compare what really makes them different, it's pretty much everything. The same idea, you could technically do the same things on both of these bikes. One is just gonna be significantly faster than the other at an easier pace with the compromise of comfort Whereas this one, you'll be comfier. You'll be able to find that perfect gear which really sets the pace. And you're gonna have a good time on it. You're gonna be able to do everything that one does. That one though, guaranteed, you will be faster on. You've got a lighter weight bike to climb. You've got a more responsive bike through the corners. You have more forgiveness in the wheels and in the suspension and in the dropper seat post. It is designed to be a fast rhythm bike. This one, I'm sure someone can do a really good job on it. This is made for a bit of commuting, a bit of light trails. This is a go do everything bike. And with a go do everything bike, there's compromises, which is the geometry and position is not intuitive to win races. So thank you everyone who has already subscribed. The weather is changing around here. So we will be biking very soon, which is gonna be a nice addition to this video set. We're gonna be able to actually take some of these bikes out, ride them on the trail, give you an on-trail review of them as well. Just get some cool action shots, make a few movies and uh, see where it goes from there. Thanks for subscribing. Like if you like that kind of thing and comment if you wanna see something specific or have a question about either of the bikes we talked about today. Like I said, we were on the Marlin 5 and the Top Fuel 9.9 .9, technically.